one site to another. Uh, item seven is consideration of the amendment of the site cleanup requirements for the rented class. So I'd like uh, Ralph Renner to give us that presentation. I was hoping I could change the title from cleaners to something else. We <laughs> <laughs> take it to the cleaners today. But, but anyway, <laughs> so uh, good afternoon, Terry Young, uh, the board members. I'm Ralph Lambert, a professional geologist, a certified hydrogeologist with the Toxics Cleanup Division. And I'm presenting the revised tentative order for Prosperity Cleaner site located in Renwood Plaza. Also, provide a brief. Uh, update of recent activities. I know the board's heard about this site several times, but I'll provide some background information as a refresher. Then I'll mention that the recent, uh, mention recent site activities. I'll summarize the major issues from the comments we've received on the tentative order and our responses. I'll discuss the tentative order, which was revised to reflect some comments. Finally, our summary conclusions. So, Brentwood Plaza is a mostly vacant neighborhood shopping center located adjacent to Highway 101 in Brentwood, an unincorporated area of Marin County located north of San Rafael. Uh, north is to the top in all the slides. Brentwood Plaza covers about five acres bounded by a residential neighborhood called Casa Moranwood on the west, and Highway 101 in the middle of the slide on the east. The Moranwood Plaza property boundary is shown by the dashed white line, the former dry cleaners uh, in yellow. The blue line on the south represents Miller Creek, and the open area uh, to the east the Silvera Ranch, which is an operating uh, dairy ranch, and they have a few residences uh, and they rely on groundwater. To the upper right is uh, owned by Catholic Charities and they operate uh, St. Vincent School. They do not use groundwater. The site was operated as a dry cleaner, and based on the results of the investigation, um, in the that found the common dry cleaning solvent PCP. A case was opened in 2008. The dry cleaner and the adjacent stores are unoccupied. The board adopted and amended the site cleanup order 2014. There have been several interim remedial actions that include installing clay cut off walls along utility trenches to minimize transport of vapors through preferential pathways. Uh, successfully treating a couple of soil uh, source areas where contamination was spilled or leaked on the ground, and installing a well-fed treatment system on a private well at the ranch as a precautionary measure. Interim remedial measures are clean up mitigation actions that can be taken quickly to address a health threat or to minimize a continuing release. They are not meant to be the final remedy by themselves. Recent activities include a nine-month-long off-site groundwater treatment pilot study that started in mid-2017. The owner has now proposed a final remedy design for the groundwater based on the results of the pilot study. Recent activities also include us directing the installation of additional vapor probes to verify the concentration and stability of the vapor probe. The discharger is waiting for access approval from the Homeowners Association Board to install those paper probes for the off-site ones. We've also recently approved additional borings along the proposed treatment lines to finalize treatment depths uh, along those lines. We needed to amend the site cleanup order to accommodate a phased cleanup approach for the site. Directive letters had already established separate due dates for on site soil hotspot remediation and off site groundwater remediation reports. And a prior directive letter already set a 10 year time frame for the off site groundwater remediation, but these dates were not finalized or formalized in the order. Therefore, we prepared a tentative order, sometimes referred to as just a TO on some of my slides 
with minor revisions and send it out for public comment in May. Today we'll discuss the revised TL. So, uh, comments were received on the tentative order um, from Silvera Ranch, from Catholic Charities, and various neighbors and members of the public. All of the comments and responses are in your package. The main uh, key issues in the comments are these three. Uh, first, the additional cleanup is needed on site, specifically for groundwater and soil vapor, and additional soil cleanup at the eastern hotspot. Number two, that there is a data gap on Caltrans property. And three, the adequacy of the off-site groundwater cleanup proposal. I'll discuss each issue. So the first comment, or first issue, is that additional on-site cleanup is needed, including groundwater, soil vapor, and more soil at the eastern hotspot. We respond that the uh, soil source or hotspot areas cleanup is, has been done. At the eastern hotspot, all 40 confirmation soil samples and then the 49 confirmation soil samples from under the dry cleaner excavation source area hotspots meet the soil cleanup goals. I calculate that these two source areas contain a total of about one gallon of solids based on the soil sampling prior to remediation. The soil vapor concentrations of the eastern hotspot reflect this cleanup and is brought to greater than 99% but still is above vapor cleanup goals. And so we are requiring the owners to evaluate additional vapor remediation on site. The need for this vapor remediation is primarily based on the results from a new vapor probe installed last year inside of the dry cleaner and outside of the uh, area that was excavated and our evolving understanding of vapor intrusion. Groundwater concentrations at the eastern hotspot have dropped over 90%. And four of the five on-site wells meet um, groundwater monitoring wells now meet the drinking water standard for PCE. But two of the on-site wells now exceed the drinking water standard for breakdown products, showing that PCE is being degraded after amendments were added to the two source areas. And uh, additional groundwater treatment is planned for the groundwater leaving the site. So the second key issue, Caltrans property needs evaluation. Well, there have been seven groundwater samples collected on Caltrans <coughs> property, and they don't suggest any significant source. However, no soil or soil vapor samples have been taken on their property. So tasks 14 and 15 have been added to collect um, additional samples as explained in the next slide. So this figure shows, let's see if we can find the mouse here, okay, eastern hotspot labeled EHS here. There's a little blue, a blue car for scale, bye bye. Uh, shows the location of the dry cleaner, the approximate property boundary shown in red along the tree line uh, with the, the property boundary with the Caltrans. We see the freeway on ramp, part of Highway 101. Ralph, is there a culvert on that aerial photo? Yes. So this blue it? line, uh, there's a, a storm drain right here uh, taking uh, storm, storm water, whatever. And it flows under the on ramp, then goes in an open channel to the north. It goes to the north and then eventually under the freeway continues. So, and I think this is an important line of reasoning. I'll get on the microphone. When we first saw this a number of years ago, we found um, products to the north of where we would expect them if they were flowing through the groundwater towards Mother Creek. And this is the the culvert that is the likely source of the transportation through that, or is it too high? Is it above the groundwater? Oh, well, this is storm and it's surface water here. Uh, 
we think that a lot of that flow is controlled to, to the north. So, yeah, that a lot of that, or most of it, is uh, controlled by the lithology. And that's why it's going the direction it's going. Okay. But, uh, so we do have this culvert, uh, storm drain, and there have been those samples collected. Uh, Caltrans provided this uh, drainage map, or, or a drainage map. <coughs> and uh, so, uh, before you go on, so what's the, is there a specific rationale for those particular locations on the Caltrans property? Okay, those red uh, air, uh, stars are the approximate locations where groundwater samples have already been collected. They actually collected seven. Uh, some, of the, some of these locations were, were one of them with multiple depths. So uh, of this seven groundwater samples, three of them exceeded drinking water standard for PCE. The northernmost one, closest to eastern hotspot, there's actually no, no PCE there. Uh, the eastern hotspot's visible in the photo because the pavement was removed uh, as part of the treatment process. But, uh, so we've added, uh, anyway, in, in response to comments, we've uh, added some new tasks recommending collecting uh, samples uh, just on the other side of the property line, uh, Caltrans. Uh, near the eastern hotspot, and then shallow samples along the drainage pathway. These are soil samples. Uh, soil samples, uh, so and soil vapor and soil here, because vapor can collect or represent a larger area than the soil, and there's already additional groundwater sampling proposed. So, uh, I mean, if they they may end up collecting. We're adding some more, but, uh, but they already proposed may be sufficient for, for that. And, and so we'll be investigating. <coughs> we'll be investigating potential let me go back here, uh, potential uh, migration of the PCE onto Caltrans. So the third key issue is the proposed remedial uh, groundwater uh, remediation is not enough. The, uh, the uh, offsite landowners argue that uh, a more robust, robust uh, program of injections needed to rapidly clean up the offsite groundwater to drinking water standards. We conclude that the 10-year time frame that we put in here is ample incentive for a robust, clean, robust cleanup effort and that we should not micromanage the cleanup plan, and that we cannot dictate the manner of compliance. In any event, the appropriate place to address this comment is in our review of the pilot test completion report where the revised groundwater cleanup plan is proposed, not the revised tentative order. The proposed uh, groundwater remediation plan was also sent out for public comment, and a few comments were received from Silvera Ranch and Caltrans. We plan to respond to those comments uh, in the plan shortly. So based on part of comments received, we have revised the tentative order who was sent out for comment. This slide lists the key changes to the current cleanup order. The tasks shown in yellow were in the tentative order that went out for comment. Tasks shown in green were added in response to comments, and both are in the revised tentative order. Uh, the bottom two tasks we haven't talked about um, are provisional tasks to make it easier to address future changes in health criteria or new data that may become available. They are standard language in new orders. I want to point out there's some confusion on what compliance state is in the order. Compliance date for all tasks is a due date for a document, such as a work plan or a report. So in summary, we needed to update the existing order. 
to revise the tentative order to address key issues, uh, or we did revise it, and um, we recommend adopting the tentative order. This concludes my presentation. Are there any questions?
Here's on the edge of the property, water going off uh, from the site uh, on Caltrans and Caltrans. Part of this is Caltrans. Some of that, well, most of this is on the ranch. The ranch and some extending into uh, uh, Catholic Charities property. <laughs> And what's the timetable for those slurry walls to be put in? They're not slurry walls, they're uh, permeable reactive barriers would be a better term. But, uh, so they, they need a, approval from us on, on this plan, and I'm planning to get, uh, provide, uh, respond this month. And then it's a matter, so I approved, they've got exploratory borings at various locations to check the depths. Uh, those are already approved. They haven't happened yet, uh, but I approved them last month. And, um, but they, they plan to do that this year. Is, that, is, is the fundamental business between the room and residents and the board the question about whether the toxic hotspots have been fully excavated? And what I understand from your presentation, you believe they have been uh, excavated to the level that they need to be to remove the threat. There's a difference of view, I think, when the member during the president's comments. Is that the heart of the difference between the parties? Um, they, they want to see, as I understand it, uh, things cleaned up all the way now, uh, basically, and including water and vapor on site. Um, so here's another figure. Just showing vapor. So, Rainbow Plaza on the right, residence is on the left, showing well, some of the vapor sample locations. The green area exceed, is the area exceeding residential vapor standards. Uh, there are 21 samples collected in the neighborhood with no detections. This oval is the area, the only area exceeding commercial vapor standards. Uh, and, and so there's no occupied housing over the green, there's no occupied building uh, over the red currently. So there's not a, uh, a current exposure, uh, but we've asked them to look into uh, options for, for some faster cleanup uh, for, the, uh, for the vapor here. And the vapor, these readings are how recent? Uh, well, these readings tend to be, well, depends which readings. Um, several, several of these are several years old. And, uh, but, like, the spots in the oval are, are permanent vapor probes. Well, one of them has been destroyed and replaced by another one. Uh, there, we do have, I can't remember, I think nine vapor probes, uh, permanent, and there's four more they're trying to get access uh, approval for them. And these readings, at least the ones within the oval, are they post excavation? Um, yes. Yeah. I, 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 the readings that are, the numbers off there probably aren't post, but, uh, but they still exceed post uh, excavation, they still exceed the uh, commercial cleanup you know, standards. And, and why is that? It, it's pretty tight soil, the shallow stuff, and it's taken a while for it to clean up. Uh, they treated the, the, the soil, the hot spots that we knew of. Uh, there's probably some that's still out there that we, you know, little isolated spots that we don't know of. Um, <clears throat> but it's dropped dramatically, for example. That's a graph of, uh, the vapor at the eastern hotspot. Um, total vapor started out at 2.4 million, and they're down um, around 8,000 now. But you know, which is still above the standard. Do you have a, a comparable chart for the need, where the dry cleaning is located? Uh, I don't. Um, is the trend comparable? Uh, no, because they just excavated the dry cleaner last year, and they they dug out the uh, paper probe in the, uh, in, in the process of, in the close as well. But there's a new one in there. So. Yeah, there's a new one outside of where they dug. So it's, it's lower than it was, 
but it's it's high. It's 180,000. And in, in your professional experience, that doesn't suggest significant body of free products still there. Uh, no, but it does suggest that there, there is something that, like I said. Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned the two hot spots. My estimation there's a total of one gallon uh, prior to treatment between the two. Uh, I usually, for vapor, I usually look for something that's over a million micrograms per cubic meter for a representative source. But there, there is still something there and that should be treated. And so that's why we, we added a, uh, a uh, task for that. And you know, that, that was a probe that was put in the middle of last year. Ralph, can you go back to the, to the, to the vapor? I, I have one further question. It, it, it seems to me a couple of things. First of all, there's two monitoring wells, monitoring well 11 and 13, that are both about 200 feet beyond the plume. Now, you can see them there. Uh, this, the scale doesn't show up, but it does online. And, and I got one. So, so those are out about 200 feet. Now, this map seems kind of consistent with about 30 years of discharge at 50 feet a year. That's kind of how it works out. Um, it's possible that there's some product beyond that at very low levels, but certainly not a lot because you're, you're getting non-detected that, right? I would say there's no product. Period. Period. Plume. Okay, but um, <clears throat> so <coughs> pardon me. So keep in mind, everything is below in the entire plume, the groundwater plume. Everything's below 100 parts per billion. Right. So source area, I usually look for something at least one part per million or a thousand. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean it could extend. Uh, you know, there's places that have been sampled. There's actually been a few hundred uh, grab groundwater samples that helped that, uh, that helped to find this plume, but there are on this map. So, so I guess the, the point that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be clear here is that we've got trenches pretty close to the leading edges of both of those. We've got slow groundwater flow and, and just the nature of bringing the product by the, the, you know, the, the, the by remediation, it's going to take time. Oh, yeah. The only way it gets treated is for the groundwater to move through the treatment zone. And since groundwater moves approximately 50 feet a year in the permeable zone, it takes it takes years for that water to move and get treated. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to make that point here with the, the picture before everybody so they can see. Uh, yeah. And then if you're in a finer grain zone, the water moves slower and uh, it would take longer. Actually, so I, I had a sort of related question, but uh, less clear to me. So I'm looking at the edge of the plume close to uh, monitoring well 13. So I'm wondering why we don't have any of those trenches at that edge. I guess I guess my bigger question is, you know, like right on the bottom right side of your screen. Okay. Why is it? So let me let me ask you another question. Maybe maybe that you can clarify that for me. So I don't I have not done this kind of work, so I'm just learning this out. But if I had this issue, I would just go from the edges and try to stop the flow from moving and then try to go in the middle part. I feel like uh, there is this, you know, your, um, some of these edges are not necessarily being uh, treated. Uh, treated. Right. And we did actually mention right now that unless the groundwater flows through these stretches, you're not going to get the treatment happening, right? Uh, other than the, by dispersion or, or, or some know. natural degradation, sure. right? So, so if you're asking why are the trenches going further, the treatment going further, or, or at the edges? Why are they cut the edges? Good question. Why are these 
starting, maybe I, while you're addressing that, also wouldn't be the better strategy to go from the edges to the middle rather than sort of uh, uh, do we have a timeline or all these things happening at the same time? Um, well, first off, my view, you want to treat the, hot, the highest concentration. Okay. That's your biggest thing for the buyer and, and for like the biggest difference. And as you treat the higher areas, the fringe areas, you expect it to perhaps naturally degrade or disperse. Now, uh, I'm not saying it could go out further, but uh, uh, um, one of the things, uh, one of the concerns, and, and I haven't seen any specific data on this, but one of the concerns is that on the low concentrations area areas, the, uh, the bugs they have, there isn't enough contamination to, to help them thrive. Because it's such a low concentration that the bugs won't uh, multiply uh, enough. And that's, I, I haven't seen anything specific, but that's one of the ideas that's put forth. So the reason, so the reason, so you're saying the reason we're not doing all the fringes is because there's not enough concentration to create a multiplier effect and get. That's that's one of the reasons the uh, consultants have put forth. Okay, but is that? Well, is that I, I don't know. I, I don't have firm data on that. Okay. And a, another idea that has been put forth is that. Well, okay, but that's not one. another data is that the main concentration is being controlled by uh, more permeable units, and so there's preferential pathway. Yeah. And that's, that's where the water flows through. Sure. So if the water is not flowing, even if there's contamination there, it won't get treated. Uh, so you can put treatment out there, the water's flowing at 10 feet a year. Um, it's going to be real difficult to do something about. So I'm, I'm still. But, but that is a question that people have. There's no doubt about I mean, that. It's, it, I think I understand that you want to treat the hot spot and hot spots and the, you know the, the highest concentration you have. But I would also be concerned that this is moving. The plume is expanding. So. I would like to stop the plume from expanding while I'm also dealing with a, you know, high concentration zone. So, so I, I this, so I'm just wondering. Okay. Well, uh, just to, to bring back a little bit, um, the revised tentative order is not talking about the treatment part of the, of the plume, but uh, it doesn't add the uh, time frame. Yet. But the design is, is a different issue. But yeah, I, I, I understand that. And so they are monitoring, and, and my thoughts are is that we'll look at adding some more monitoring points around in different places to see what's happening. That's sometimes the challenge with groundwater plume maps is that there's a sense, oh, this is going to keep moving. And I think part of the message that Rob has is certain degree if it is moving potentially in preferential yeah. pathways, but it's already quite low out of that leading edge. And typically when it's at that level, we uh, historically relied upon natural attenuation to a certain degree at those low levels. Generally, as, as Rob says, obviously we want to get back to the buck. We're optimistic that the uh, this charter and consultant recognize that 10 years is an aggressive time frame and they need to be uh, constantly monitoring and reviewing this to ensure that that is the right, right place. But also recognize Ross's point is that the amendment to the site cleanup requirements doesn't specifically speak to this uh, groundwater regulation line, yes. but it does codify the 10 year time frame. I have a, a quick question um, that I'm not sure that's the answer to, but um, is there a reason?
reason why the uh, there were not previously soil samples taken in the Caltrans right of way. Um, I understand there was groundwater, and the groundwater samples showed no concern. Um, but it's, it um, seems to me that whatever reason that makes sense now would have made sense earlier in the investigation as well. I, I think that's a good question. The um, I went <coughs> three of the seven groundwater samples were about drinking water stand. I mean, uh, but uh, typically, so they don't show evidence of a of a, any source or a big source, but there could be something there. Um, and so the other reason you sample soil typically is for direct contact, and um, hopefully you don't have people walking um, along the freeway getting being exposed. But we think it's reasonable to, to go ahead and look, and uh, not too expensive to go ahead and look at the soil and see if there's you know some remaining source. And then Caltrans asked for the shallow sampling along the drainage pathway, which we actually didn't know where the pathway was, in case they go in and uh, grow the weeds out of that. Whom he or she represents, 
and whether he or she took the oath to tell the truth. The hearings will not be conducted according to technical rules of evidence. The board will accept any evidence or testimony that is reasonably relevant to the issues. All board files, exhibits, and agenda materials pertaining to this matter will be made part of the record of this proceeding. Additional written material will be made part of the record at the discretion of the board. Those wishing to testify in the hearing will now rise or raise your hand. Do you promise to tell the truth? Thank you. All right, let's see if we can make this happen. Uh, first, we'll ask for Mr. John Wilner, presenting Greenwood Plaza. that um, you issued an aggressive order uh, last year calling for a 10-year cleanup. Uh, the, the owner and their consultants have embraced that order and have implemented a very aggressive cleanup plan. Um, you know, thankfully, you approved a pilot project which was completed and submitted. And what I don't think was necessarily mentioned is that the recommendation of the consultant was to intensify the number of wells in order to ensure tenure completion. So this is not a situation of a recalcitrant party. This is a, a situation where you have someone who's taking your order very seriously and doing everything they can uh, to comply with it. And uh, alluding to something that, that uh, uh, Board Member McGrath said earlier, they definitely have a lot of skin in this game. Uh, they've spent well over a million dollars. They were spending a lot more uh, over the next 10 years to get this done. Uh, and they've embraced your order. So um, as, an, as an overall view, I'm happy to, to have uh, Brian, our consultant, or myself answer any specific questions along the lines that you are asking. Um, but as an overview, I think you have what I hope you understand to be a, a very cooperative and dedicated partner. The reason we have comments today uh, is because there were, in response to comments, a couple of last minute, very material changes to the proposed amendment that we have not had an opportunity to comment on. As you know, the original tentative order was primarily about the 10 year time frame, which we embraced. It was uh, sent out on April 18, and then comments were due on May 21st. Um, on June 27, which is only two weeks ago, we were notified of the two material changes to the order that require, in, in the language of the order, a pretty thorough and uh, uh, involved investigation of this Caltrans property soil, and also additional work on site. Um, we asked if we could submit written comments, and we're told the only way to do it is to show up at the hearing and read the letter to you. So that's what we're going to do, and Brian's going to read it. I guess what I would say is, in, you know, the, the plan that was submitted and, and approved and the new plan that we've submitted post-pilot is a comprehensive plan to get this groundwater clean. And these two items, the uh, additional Caltrans investigation and, and the additional investigation on site uh, regarding soil vapor, we view as unnecessary. They're going to take resources, time, efforts, and funds away from the broader cleanup. Um, and we think they're already covered. So I'll let Brian deal with that. But um, uh, you know, the, the key piece that I would highlight to you, and I think, I think Mr. Lambert uh, explained this well, and it was echoed by some of you, at this point, that, you know, the, what the report states is the on-site sources of contamination have largely been removed and human and ecological exposure is controlled to acceptable risk levels. Um, source control is essentially done. And so to order additional investigation with regard to vapor on a site that is vacant uh, to us is an unnecessary expense and a distraction from what we're really trying to do, which is clean up the ground. So I'll let, I'll let 
Brian, right. I'll let her answer further questions, if that's okay. Yes, I was going to suggest the same thing that leads director questions to these two gentlemen all at once. I did neglect to uh, call everyone's attention to the fact that we're going to be timing people and ask you to try to keep it to three minutes. I think that that would be quite possible for most of you because we know how familiar we are with this site and these issues. Uh, so, um, Mr. Ogden. Okay, we, uh, after getting this handed of order, we prepared a letter which I provided to Ralph yesterday. <coughs> I'm a better writer than the reader, so I'll just uh, read the letter. Uh, we're su submitting these comments on behalf of Marinwood Plaza, LLC, the owner of the subject property. Thank you for the opportunity to submit comments on the revised tentative order proposed for the Prosperity Cleaners site. Summary of comments. We respectfully urge the board not to adopt the proposed amendment 7B, 7C, 14, and 15 to the site cleanup order for the above reference site. As explained below, the proposed amendments to the site cleaning order are redundant to the existing order and will redirect financial resources away from current efforts, potentially resulting in delays in their remedial program. In addition, the order amendments establish deadlines for several new tasks that will drive up the cost of cleanup unnecessarily and will prevent Marinwood LLC from mitigating its costs by conducting portions of the cleanup in conjunction with redevelopment of the site. Since the contamination was discovered in 2007, Marinwood has worked closely with regional board staff and spent well over $1 million to investigate and remediate the contamination. Moreover, data provided to regional board staff make clear that the site currently poses no immediate or imminent threat to human health or environmental risk. It is therefore unclear why staff are asking the board to issue the proposed amendments to the order at this time, except perhaps as a response to political pressure. Marinwood has been conscientious about investigating and remediating the site and responsive to the reasonable concerns of the regional board. Uh, amending the order with a series of narrowly focused subtasks already captured by existing requirements of the order is inappropriate and ultimately counterproductive. Uh, comments. Proposed tasks, proposed tasks 7B and 7C on site soil vapor cleanup. The proposed amendment to the order acknowledges that Marinwood Plaza has implemented significant soil cleanup actions at the two hotspots. There is no evidence that the soil cleanup actions that have already been completed will be ineffective over time. DOC concentrations have declined since these actions were completed. Moreover, there is no evidence of current or imminent threats to current receptors. As such, there is no basis for requiring remedial action to protect on-site receptors, of which there are currently none. If at the time of redevelopment, VOC concentrations still exceed cleanup levels protective of the proposed post-development land use, then additional remedial measures will be undertaken at that time. Implementing remedial measures in advance of redevelopment is an unnecessary financial burden that may impede Marigua Plaza's ability to fund other required cleanup work. This proposed new task is redundant with rework required in the original order that already has set cleanup levels for soil gas. The timing of site redevelopment is unknown. We strongly disagree with the statement in the tentative order that it is reasonable to address the vapor intrusion threat independent of any redevelopment plans or schedule, unquote. This is completely counter to the technical standard of care for site remediation, particularly for soil vapor, where exposure pathways and site receptors are key to remedial design. I'm going to ask you to summarize the rest of you. I can't tell how many pages you've got left there. Yeah, I mean, the letter's almost done, and I guess what we would ask is for a little indulgence because these are written comments. If it's almost done, that's fine. Yeah, there's one paragraph. Okay. Now, this is with regard to tax 14 and 15 data gap on Caltrans property. The proposed amendment requires a new investigation on Caltrans property immediately adjacent to the eastern hotspot. There's no reasonable basis for this request. The revised tentative order itself states, quote, we doubt that any significant PCE contamination or risk is present on Caltrans property, unquote. Moreover, there's no evidence of any current or future receptors. The off-site groundwater remediation pilot test implementation report already proposes groundwater sampling and in-situ groundwater treatment on the Caltrans right away. As there are no current or future receptors on the Caltrans property, groundwater treatment is the only reasonable action. 
The proposed investigation will only take time and resources away from the necessary cleanup. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, do we have questions for either Mr. Aubrey or Mr. Warner? <coughs> Very clear. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Renee Silvera. I'm here today on behalf of my mom, who's the owner of the property. Just to come today. Um, you know, we've looked at this plume map many, many, many times, and I have to say, we're still pretty fortified. We haven't gotten used to it. Um, I'm here today just to impress upon you, and I think I, I sense that you understand how startling we feel. This has to be a very, you know, prompt and swift um, action as we can expect of this remediation effort. Um, our environmental consultant um, believes that the treatment lines don't extend out far enough. And so if you look at that map that I just distributed, um, Geologica proposed the green lines, and our consultant proposes the blue lines. And I would have to say that we are very, very um, adamant that we want sufficient treatment lines to capture the contours that represent PCE above the water drinking standard that's entering our property in St. Vincent's as well. Um, as far as the, um, the eastern hotspot, I know that the level there went up recently, and I heard that that could possibly be because there was sort of a maybe kind of flushing effect um, at the hotspot under the, the dry cleaners, and it moved more material out. The way that we look at it, it's just more of a load coming toward our property, and we'd like to, you know, Save off that that front as much as possible, and so whatever can be done within the Caltrans um, property to minimize the amount that's entering. You know, one could say, well, those are low levels, but it is still more PCE that's getting into our property, and will continue to move through our property for a decade or more. I, I'm reading from the responses here that um, you know it's it may be difficult to achieve our goals within 10 years and so I think we have to really expand what we're doing here with the treatment lines to maximize what we can do within that decade and then also let's see here it's interesting that it, it came up about the fringes on the southern eastern portion of the plume we are a little bit concerned about that in terms of what may happen. It seems to me there's a certain amount of mystery to how um, this is all, you know, happening subterraneanly. So um, we do, I think, we need a little bit more double checking out there on the southeast. I guess that's it. Thank you very much for um, your time. Thank you. Folks who drew this map, they're not here today. Is that no. Right? Okay. 
So to, as you recall, um, what was the, what was the rationale that behind why they drew the blue lines where the blue lines? Um, it's to capture the, um, the contours of the plume that are beyond, above the drinking water um, standard. This is this is normal here. I'm the section uh, leader for I'm not the section, and I took the oath this morning. So actually, that was the point that I wanted to make. But you guys were asking questions early on. The point is that um, that the transect that are built and are proposed by the consultant are up to the six times of the MCL of 30 micrograms per liter. And um, so one of the problems that they would encounter to extend it is the efficiency in which you know, they would be able to degrade um, you know, basically what would remain of the concentration between the MCL, the 5, to the 30. And so my understanding is that the consultant is um, right now just using this as its the first kind of round of, of transects and may in the future extend it depending on the amount of recovery and efficiency they are getting using what they believe is reasonable for the 30 Let, let me ask a follow-up to that, um, because we, have, as I understand Mr. Lambert's answer earlier, um, we're not exactly sure why it might or might not work, and what the what the constant what the limiting factor is in the concentration in terms of uh, keeping these organisms alive and functioning and gobbling up goo. Um, so, what would be wrong with having one or two transits where you extended it all the way out and kind of determined whether anything was happening on the outer edges and whether it was being, whether it was effective or not? Would that something that anyone considered doing? I think, I think yes, that is feasible something that is you know, that could be considered by the consultant but you know as, as I explained they may not get that efficiency you know, within that five to thirty micrograms per mm -hmm. but at least they would be able to assess it if they want to try it sure okay and another follow-up question to your and I'm sorry to keep you standing up there but I think you want to stay there <laughs> for just a little bit longer um, if it turns out that uh, one would want to extend some of the lines that weren't um, it's, let me start my sentence over again. Let's say with one of these transects, we start with a green line, and we decide later on we want to go with the blue lines. Is there any reason why that's infeasible? I mean, can we always extend the lines, or do you have to like start all over again? things up and destroy what you've done already? Yeah, they would just extend the lines. I mean, that wouldn't be that complicated. Okay. I'm sorry if I jumped on your question. No, not at all, but I mean, I guess to pick up on, on, on our um, chair's suggestion, why, there, there's nothing that would prevent us from, for example, to take up Ms. Lavera's suggestion that for the first two transects, the ones that are on either side of Highway 101, doing what is a relative to some of the other transects of a relatively modest expansion of a line which based on the concentrations shown on this map um, seemingly would be more comprehensive uh, and yet would be very little bang, would be very little expenditure, maybe it wouldn't be a, lot of, a great deal of bang for the buck, but it wouldn't be a lot of box to do it. So why wouldn't we do that, why wouldn't we, as a board, tell the consultants 
attitude that this character would, would like to have to happen, would like the, their design to be modified in that manner. Since there is, as we talked about earlier, continuing hot spots on the other side of the highway. Yeah, that would be probably the most efficient area of the plume. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's the closest of the former source. And it's where we have the acid concentration line that are the closest to each other as well. Yeah. And so, um, very likely. But why didn't we ask the consultant to do that work? Is because we, we thought that the phased approach would be more efficient than potentially just doing a test uh, across the freeway. But it's, you know, it's something that we considered. Yeah. I think you've got the argument about why the phase approach is not entirely for extending the electron. <laughs> Well, I do recognize that uh, today's action is to formalize the requirement for the remedial action plan by 2027. And certainly, uh, as we say, we feel that that's still an impressive time frame so that the consultant is going to want to consider any and all options to meet that. We also have the task in the order that talks about evaluation of new technical information, essentially allows uh, the executive officer to require evaluation before it's moved to vote. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I, I guess my reaction is, I know that's not what's specifically in front of us today, but the, the Solaris and the Marinewood residents have been very effective in saying, look, this has gone on for a very long time, and, and, and I'm reacting to that by saying I'd like to see us as a board, as a, as a staff, uh, taking that into account and um, uh, find ways that may not be necessarily scientifically the most efficient way to do it, but nonetheless maybe the most effective way to uh, avoid a continued kind of wait and see, let's see how effective this is. We know what the remedy is. We've agreed on the remedy. It's not perfect remedy. I mean, there are different ways to go about this, but we've settled on the remedy. Now we're talking about how extensive it is in terms of its implementation. And while that's not what's before us today, I guess I would like to see staff continue to push the technical uh, consultant for the discharger to make the kinds of changes that, if nothing else, provide some peace of mind that everything that could be done is being done, at least to mitigate the amount of additional migration onto the particular plane, for example. And I actually, so going back to my earlier question, which was exactly the same thing, I want to devil on what you just said, and I want to say that I find this to be a lot more reasonable than the green lines, just because, as Bill also mentioned, you know, it's um, since we are doing trial and error anyway, why don't we actually go with the, the more conservative trial and error rather than being more, uh, you know, we'll go to this part and we'll see what happens to the rest, or, uh, you know, hopefully it will disappear itself, but, you know, maybe not. Um, and then, and that actually, I know you're saying this is not in front of us, but it, is, it will eventually impact that 10 year process, right? Sure. Because right. If, if, if these other, uh, so, you know, all these fringes of the plume ended up, starts moving in different directions, then in four years, you need another 10 years to deal with that, right? So, um, that, so I, I wanna, you know, throw my support behind the same uh, uh, sort of approach and, uh, Re-emphasize what I mentioned before. So it's really important, especially I think that on the edges, I I just don't understand why we are not going over to the edges. So. I have a couple of questions. I, I I thought of this, but I'm perhaps a little too cautious at times. Uh, it is clear that there's contamination on the Silverado's property, you know, and that's a, that's both a legal question and it's a heartbreaking question that bothered me for quite a while. Um, and, and it's also clear that one of your wells has been affected. And, and you know, even, even at very low levels, that's, that's something of concern. And I think that weighs into the equity 
Uh, on the other side, the question that I don't know, and I want to make sure that, that the, the MCL for this is five micrograms per minute. Is that correct? Yes. yes. So, so the proposal is to leave for natural attenuation those areas of the plume between 30 micrograms per liter and five micrograms per liter. And, and part of the question in my mind is how confident are we of natural attenuation before it reaches the creek or, or the well? So while I'm, I'm sympathetic to the argument and I think we should probably investigate the question of is further treatment wise and equitable, I'm mindful that it's not the only, not the only plume that we're going to have to deal with. And the ultimate question that's for our jurisdiction rather than the courts on damage is will this be sufficiently attenuated between if this approach is done um, or would there remain a risk? And I, and I don't see enough information to go one way or the other, but I, I'm pretty sure the discharger realizes he's got pretty much the whole board up here concerned about whether or not they go far enough. So uh, I aim that more at the staff to look at whether or not there should be another 13267 letter that asks that question a little more explicitly. Where exactly is the well? How sure are we of attenuation between here and the well? Um, how sure are we of, of natural attenuation uh, if no further treatment is done? So I, I just want to be a little cautious today because you know, I was looking for the well location on these. Um, I mean, I certainly think the Silveras have been damaged in the sense that their property has been contaminated and their, their well's been contaminated. And, and we need to, to weigh that, but I think we need to weigh it carefully. So may I pipe in really quickly with a couple of legal points? So one concern that I have just from the conversation is that this board may not dictate manner of compliance. So the way we usually handle that in an order is to require cleanup goals and deadlines. And then how they get there is up to them. And so I just, we're sort of walking that edge of how much should we require and how wide should the permeable reactive barriers be. Um, and I, I just want to make sure that we're bearing that in mind. If you are concerned about the cleanup not being aggressive enough, you do have knobs that you can turn, but um, going in and telling them where to put the injection points um, makes me uncomfortable from this end of the table. But if Mr. Lambert would strongly encourage certain lines to be wider, I suspect that this charger would vigorously object to it. That's good in the way of quick turnaround and approval. So if, if the proposal to Mr. Lambert is, you know, here's our cleanup plan, it's intended to meet these cleanup goals by these cleanup dates, and he disagreed and felt that the proposal was inadequate because of technical reasons that he did not agree that, then he would make the recommendation that Bruce would find this unacceptable because of those reasons. So that would be the, the route, of, and certainly his response would say, I see over here there's a hot spot that you have yet to address. I mean, he, he would make those types of comments or that, you know, perhaps um, when you inject at five feet, you're not going to address the contamination at 100 feet. Those are the types of things we would normally expect our staff to respond with. Um, and, and obviously the types of comments that he provides about the technical inadequacies would encourage obvious responses, but, um, but we don't as a practice send back their plan with here are the corrected X's of where you'll be putting your injections. So just reminding you to walk that line carefully. Let, let, I appreciate that input. Let me um, let me consolidate that with some of what I'm hearing from behind the table here. Um, when Mr. Lambert was uh, explaining the map and testifying, the question came up of, well, why don't the green lines go wider and further out? And the answer was, 
Well, there are a couple of theories for that. So then we had a proposal to actually put the green lines wider, and we are still at a point where actually the technical understanding of these lines is um, something that is going is, is being considered by people with technical expertise as to how strong they are. So I guess what I'm hearing from the board is that we would potentially like Mr. Lambert and his staff to go back and um, elicit more information from the discharger, from the Silveras consultants, and make a technical judgment as to whether there should be one or more or a dozen of these lines that maybe should be extended. Now, would we be on a legal, sound legal footing suggesting that? Encouraging communication among parties and reaching a sound technical judgment is an excellent idea and should always be encouraged by the board. Um, but, right, just remembering that the tentative order won't approve what they're talking about. Right? That's the next step. Okay, all on the same page. Apropos of that. We're all nodding. We're all on the same page. Is that exactly what I was saying? There is, there is an untreated area here of, of, of groundwater that's above the MCL. I don't think we're directing that there be a solution to that, but I'm for one not convinced that there shouldn't be some solution to that. And uh, perhaps uh, it can be explained in a manner satisfactory to this to our staff and to the board that natural attenuation will take care of that without further damage. But I don't, I'm not there yet. Well, task 7D in the revised tentative order does say that off-site groundwater is to reach drinking water standards as specified in section B, and it does provide for system expansion or modification in annual reports. So there is there is that end goal that has to be reached by any means. I think many of us just don't want to have a lot of time elapsed before we really know that this is getting cleaned up for the Severus as fast as it can and certainly within the 10 years. We don't want to have small steps at the beginning that end up having to do really big steps at the end. Let's just take the big steps at the beginning. <laughs> Close out with small steps at the end. I, I think that's the message that you're hearing. I think our, our staff understands that. Um, Ms. Silvera, I don't think there are any other questions for you. I appreciate your patience standing up there. Is there, I, I just have, since you've been so polite, I would allow you to make a, a final comment if you wish. Well, I just agree. I just think that, you know, we, there's so many variables and so many unknowns. Why not err on the side of, you know, safety and do as much as we can to snare this thing? Because, um, you know, 10 years is a long time to think that it could take longer. It's really scary. So thank you very much. I really appreciate your thought on this. All right. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And now I have a clarifying question. I don't have a card here that specifically refers to the um, Catholic Charities property, unless it's it's Mr. Barda. Yes, Mr. Barda, yes. So you're, you're representing them. Will you come up next then, please? Thank you. <clears throat> to, the, to the panel, uh, I've been sworn in. Uh, as a lawyer, I want to speak to technical matters. Uh, I, I do want to say that 10 years is a, kind of a generation, and it's too long, I think, based on the comments I've heard from the panel. I don't think that if your task today is to approve the changes, some of which we agree with that uh, Mr. Lambert's staff has made, I don't think we should fix the 10 years in. Uh, nor should the panel listen to uh, the fact that the discharger spent too much money cleaning up somebody's land. Uh, 
they can't spend enough and they can't do it fast enough. And I think that should be the message uh, that, the, that the panel can deliver. Uh, when the discharger, their lawyers, their consultants will drink from the severe as well, you might be able to listen to them as to whether they think they've, they've done their job. But so far, I don't think that's the case. Um, from the Catholic Charities point of view, we see a plume that is coming their way. Uh, I don't know how much is on our land and technically because it, it really is just, you know, it's almost like the, the blob from the Black Lagoon, if I can take us back a few generations. It just keeps growing in ways that we don't know why. Uh, and we don't have enough information to know why and where it's coming from. We now are told there's still more uh, remediation to be done on, on property that 10 years ago uh, they were talking about remediating. So we're still left with getting ready to get ready to prevent the, the, the blob from going further. Uh, I don't think we know enough to you know it won't go further or, or that it tells us some errors or my client that you can wait 10 years of drinking water. Uh, I don't think that's fair. I think that uh, we know enough to know that, it, that we're not getting the job done yet. We're not getting the job fast enough. And I, and I appreciate your feedback and attention. Thank you. Are there questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next we'll have uh, please Mary Sackett, who is an aide to supervisor in economy. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Young and the board. My name is Mary Sackett, and I am aide to supervisor Damon Connolly, who is the current supervisor where um, Ryan Plaza sits. On May 21st, Supervisor Connolly sent a letter to the board, which for technical, um, a typographical error, an email address didn't come to the board. So I wanted to bring to your attention a few issues that Supervisor Connolly raised. Um, I will say that to a large extent, those issues that were raised were addressed by Mr. Lambert's revised tentative order, which we appreciated. Um, in particular, Pleased that the tentative order is no longer waiting redevelopment of the site um, in order to address those that to evaluate to treat the soil vapor um, as is highlighted in the first uh, key issue in the staff report. We're pleased that the timeline is put in place and, and additional measures on the off-site remediation. Um, really appreciate that the revised tentative order addresses the Caltrans right away so we can answer some of those questions and see if that's the cause. Um, we welcome the opportunity for a community meeting um, to so that the community knows what's happening um, and is, is available in making um, that option so that I think it benefits everyone in dealing with rumors and um, speculation if uh, that discussion can be had. Um, I do have Supervisor Connolly's letter with me today and would ask that you exercise your discretion and accept that letter. Um, and we look forward to continuing to work with the Water Board and staff in order to get this area cleaned up as long overdue. And um, have you just summarized Mr. Conway's letter? Those are the issues that he brought us um, and mm -hmm. how they've been addressed, yeah. Um, ordinarily, I don't accept those late submissions, but in deference to Mr. Connolly being an elected official and representative of this um, area, I'm, I'm going to make an exception and accept it into the record if you'll give it to the staff to we'll make sure that happens. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I can't tell whether all the four of you remaining are part of one group or not, but let's start with Mr. Nestle and then Mr. McNicholas or one in one other, one or the other order uh, with the cleanup and Ringwood Plaza now group. Yeah, we are part of one group and uh, we, we kind of ordered our presentation. Um, I'm happy to accept whatever order you want. Now, is, is um, 
Ms. Moran and Mr. Carey, are they also part of the same group? All right. Source. 
all that work is for not unless the source is cleaned up. We strongly recommend that the technical order be disapproved because what it wants to do is split the two sites into two different work areas and we demand immediate clean closure. In addition, I have documents here post 521, which are emails on it, which is following up on my things, but post 521 petitions and cost for rent. Petitions total about 450 community signatures. Is there any questions? What we might do is reserve the questions till wow. your whole okay. day has uh, And you're up. Okay. Hello, I'm Ann Moran, and I live in Castle Ridgewood. I've been there a long time, uh, and in fact, I used to go to the dry cleaners, and I didn't know my husband's suits were coming home filled with poisonous fumes. Uh, I thought he looked great, and uh, but now we know better. And uh, so now we need to clean up over, uh, clean up our mess that, uh, that we all put up with. I'm only two lanes of traffic from the, where the dry cleaners was, uh, all of Casper and Williams. We now have little children uh, like I used to have. My children all now have gray hair. And uh, we, we have this growing, uh, mass of, of damage uh, over across the street from us. And we have no testing in Casimir Inwood. We really need uh, protection from, uh, from, the, uh, from the damage as well. Uh, I have a letter here also from, uh, I, I was on the board for 13 years. Dan Carrier was to be here today, but he had an emergency dental operation uh, due to a tooth loss last night, and asked me to read his letter. Uh, he uh, going to apologize uh, for going to see the oral surgeon instead of us today. Uh, the fact that the order is before you today was recently amended to incorporate many of the concerns of the local citizens increases my uh, concern that the process requires more oversight. It's been over there, we've known it was there, and nothing's been happening for all these years. Even, I mean, this was a vibrant uh, uh, shopping center at one time, and now it's just, we have one little grocery store, and that's, uh, they're just hanging on by their thumbs. Uh, even when the soil extraction process eventually began, it was uh, delayed and delayed. Uh, uh, I observed, Dan says, piles of contaminated soil. These piles of contaminated subsequently, these uh, piles of contamination subsequent, subsequently were drenched in heavy rains before they could be hauled away, likely allowing leaching out of whatever contaminants were extracted in the soil, now free to be leached out into the soil into the surrounding good soil, and further pollute the water tables and contribute to the related vapor issues. Casarinwood has suffered both the intrusion of toxic soil vapor at our property line from the toxic waste site of the property cleaners and decaying strip mall that has all, was all but abandoned in a thriving community. For years, we have been the ones suffering the health consequences and have a cloud over our properties. We are busy working people. A number of residents in Casamirwood are renters, but all of us care about our communities. We want the RWQCB to protect us, our environment and groundwater. We want the Marinwood Plaza owners to resolve this problem quickly and recoup their investment with the new developer who will build on the plaza. If clean liabilities remain, no one will want to risk building and the property will continue to decay. The toxic waste problem will not go away. We have children, pregnant women, and immune-compromised immune individuals who live among us. We want those people to live in a safe environment. If housing eventually comes to a Rimwood Plaza, we want our future neighbors to live in a safe environment. We firmly believe that if, your address, if you address the toxic soil contamination, 
order active soil vapor extraction, and groundwater remediation. This problem will soon be behind us. Please do the right thing and do not allow a halfway cleanup. Insist on a full, a full first and fast cleanup. I think that's what everyone wants. Thank you. And may I give you a copy of uh, Dan's letter? Uh, I, since you read it for the record, it's already in the record, but if you wish to give a copy to the staff for their records, Thanks that would be fine. I'm, I'm going to um, just clarify for the record that we just heard from Anne Moran, who is a homeowner in Casa Marinwood, and then she also read the letter from a Mr. Uh, from Dan Carrier, who is a resident from customer in wood and I have his address for your records with him. Okay. Uh, Chair Young, we have a small procedural matter if you don't mind the interruption. Yes. Um, so Mr. McNicholas um, submitted three different folders of documents and one is a set of emails that were submitted that that were sent to the regional board but they came in after the comment deadline and so um, normally the chair would rule on whether or not late uh, comments are accepted uh, Mr. Lambert and I have reviewed them. They are all roughly identical to other letters that came in before the deadline and were addressed in the response to comments. Um, and as the chair knows, the, the normal criteria for considering late comments are whether they would cause uh, surprise or undue prejudice to board staff or other interested parties. Um, and yes, I'm going to you know, move against having those be documents that you're referring to be part of the record. I did make an exception in the case of our elected representative, but um, yes, they will not be part of the record of this proceeding, but I don't see that there's any harm in staff looking at them for purposes of future work. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, my name is Stephen Nessel, um, and I did take the oath this morning. Um, and now the fun begins. I, I really have a pretty much a show and tell um, uh, presentation here um, to help clarify what we're dealing with. Um, but uh, before I begin, I, I learned uh, from uh, Ralph's uh, pictures that these may not be accurate. I thought this was Prosperity Cleaner Door 2. That's where there was some activity inside. I thought that was where the uh, uh, machinery was kept, but I'm not so certain anymore. I also didn't know about the Caltrans culvert, which um, may change things. It, we may, I'm, I'm wondering if we really know where the hot spot is. But anyhow, um, just to continue on, um, I'm standing, I just wanted to give you a visual here. So I'm standing in the hot spot right now, looking towards the door uh, facing west. Um, and this, I just turned around, and as you can see um, where I'm standing, uh, just a few meters away, or actually less than a meter away, is uh, a, a fence and the Caltrans property. And we think, um, because this is the area where uh, the toxics were dumped, and this is down gradient, obviously something is on that other side of the fence, so we absolutely need to understand what's going on on the Caltrans property. Um, really, our objective here today is really to dissuade the board from thinking that uh, a partial disclosure uh, would, would benefit um, you know, full cleanup. Um, we think that it would impair that because uh, if the site is, uh, Marine Wood Plaza is developed and Caltrans isn't uh, cleaned up, we may never actually address uh, the full extent of the plume. Now, most of my comments today uh, are non-technical, but we do have, I want to draw your attention to the committee's uh, letter because it's much more technical in, in nature. Um, so, and here, here I'm standing in Caltrans property, and you can see uh, the mirror image of the image I just showed you. Um, but this is really the critical uh, image I really want you to focus on. Um, there, uh, as you can see, uh, there was an excavation, there's prosperity cleaners uh, in the center, and uh, there was an excavation, there was treatment. 
Um, and we know that there was contamination found from all the sampling data down to at least 35 feet. And I'm not sure if it goes further than that. But uh, the main points here are we don't know um, the extent of any of the plumes or the toxic soil vapors. We know it reaches to, um, uh, uh, to the edge of Casa Marinwood. Um, I'll take issue with the characterization that there's no um, toxic soil vapors in there. All we do know is we haven't detected them yet. And so that indicates further testing. But really what we're after is active soil vapor. Uh, extraction and um, uh, uh, treatment of the contaminated soil. Uh, we know the extent of the contaminant pollutant is over a half mile. That was adequately addressed earlier. And um, the question we, we have is, well, what's happening with all this toxic soil vapor? Um, we didn't test at the residential utilities or utility junctions, and these are key point, key, key areas. So I, um, the bottom line is we're still dealing with the toxic waste issue. The other uh, point about environmental justice, we think this is really critical. I know it's part of uh, you know, what you guys are, need to do. There's laws concerning that. Um, uh, Marinwood Plaza has been identified for low-income housing. So we're, the way we look at it is it doesn't matter what goes on goes on in this site, we need to clean it up because these future people who um, will be our neighbors, they deserve environmental justice. Um, obviously, there's health effects, and who suffers most, unfortunately, and, um, is uh, Hispanics and basically, uh, you, you know, uh, minority folks, and um, we, we don't think that's right. We have the full uh, support of the community. You have the Catholic Church, you have St. Vincent's, Silvera Ranch, um, concerned environmentalists throughout Marin. We have 450 um, residents who signed the uh, petition. And, you know, it's been, what, six years? I, I don't even know. Um, and we're not going anywhere. We're, you know, we're, we're sticking with it. Um, and I, I'll make one other point. Um, we're, we understand that this is a uh, part money and part science, and we're uh, certainly willing to uh, uh, a, a program uh, that is scientifically accurate and responsible. So um, I, I don't, I, I think we understand that uh, treatment takes time, but we also understand the very simple fact that if you don't remove the source contamination, the soil vapor continues, and the groundwater uh, continues. So thank you very much for your time. I'll answer any questions. Yes, that's, that's I was just laughing at myself. I've just been just awful at managing the clock today, so I'm sorry. <laughs> These points seem like they've been important. Um, do we have questions? I have a question. Okay. Could I have you put up your graphic on soil vapor? Oh. One more time? Okay. Yeah, no, th this is actually an old slide that you've seen before, but um, it's really done for the, just the point that these are the points that uh, uh, were, were tested, um, and we're just concerned that it wasn't fully addressed at that time. Um, right. So well, it's... I'm, I'm looking at the... 2300 concentration that you have highlighted sitting right next to the non detect And I wanted to actually ask the staff if I could. Sure. Um, whether that makes sense to you. Um, okay, this, this is Ralph. Um, on the scale, I don't remember. There might be 15 feet apart or something. Uh, I wanted to point out that the uh, so samples were collected between, it's no longer 2,300, but I think it's 1,200. No, it's like 2,200 now, well, as the base of the sample. 20, 20, yes. Any, anyway, uh, samples were collected a, a few between that location and the nearest housing, as well as samples were collected along utility corridors uh, where 
Virgil's Court where the utilities entered the houses. So and they showed? Yes. And, and, and they were all non-detectable. And they were all also non-detectable. Yes. Okay. And how recently was that done? Uh, that was done three years ago. Uh, so, something like oh, that. Okay. Uh, so we have a proposal um, to put three more probes uh, near the housing, and they've been trying for a couple months to get the homeowners association uh, uh, permission uh, and the homeowners association voting on that uh, on the 17th. Okay. Ralph, while you're, while you're up there, one of the things that we heard in testimony was that um, monitoring well five, which is pretty close to the excavation, was down close to drinking water standard and it popped back up to 76 microgas per liter. As I, as I look at the, the uh, plume map, figure six from uh, your report, it, it looks like that, uh, that location is at the western edge of the 70 uh, microgram isoplex. And, and I, I know we dug a big hole there. Uh, uh, MW5 is closest to the eastern hot spot where there were injections. The hole was inside the dry cleaner. Uh, since since the since the excavation, um, and then they put amendments in the base of the excavation to help treat things. Uh, there's been things have been moved around. Uh, we, we've seen concentrations hop around in, in the two uh, two of the closest wells. And of course, the the proposal um, is to put one of our injection, uh, our, our reactive barriers, right there. Yes. And one between there and the highway. So, I, I guess there's a little bit of an understanding that we're talking about closure. We're talking about active groundwater treatment. Right. There's there's no proposal for closure at this point. So I I, I just want to make sure that that's on the record that, that we're not thinking about closure. We're cleaning up the groundwater. Yeah, there's, um, they, they talk about splitting the site. It, 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 those are due dates for reports. And those are already, it, it, it already exists, that distinction in tasks um, four and five between on-site and off-site. Uh, that distinction already exists, separate due dates. But we have, we have, fairly substantially contaminated groundwater in that area that needs to be treated and it's not successful. Well, we, okay, okay, what was the question? I missed that. Well, we have, it, it's pretty clear to me looking at this map that we have a, a plume with some of the higher higher concentrations in the ground. We have, we have one well of six wells that have been put on site that exceeds the drinking water standard for PCE now. And that's well five. Uh, and one of those wells has been destroyed, uh, but it didn't exceed it. So, uh, and two of the five wells exceed the drinking water standard for the breakdown products now. And we're going to proceed to treat, and we're going to proceed to monitor across the road in the Caltrans property. Yes, and on site. And, and I, I share your concerns with the Caltrans property. Uh, in Berkeley, there'd be a homeless camp. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think, you know, making sure that we understand what's there uh, and, and can make it safe for anybody that happens to pitch it in the if, if I could just mention a couple of things. Uh, there's no low-income housing proposed there. Uh, there was multiple years ago and that was shot down. And uh, so there, there's no proposal for, for that now that I heard of anyway. Sorry, please use the microphone when you speak so that our court reporter can hear what you're saying. I think we just had an exchange about whether or not there's low both, income. Both Dave and Harrier and I, I'm sorry. Both Dave and Harrier and I were on the board as of October, and I don't remember any request to do any testing in Casimir and Wood to the board. You may have been requesting it now. Oh, uh, that, that's been in the last two months. Okay. okay. Uh, one other thing, uh, I've never heard of a restriction 
proposed uh, that would restrict trees or vegetables uh, for the site or any other site that we're done than that. Um, all right, but as, as Mr. McGrath pointed out, that's part of uh, something that we would talk about at the, at the point where we would be doing closure. So those, yeah, those we're not concerns are concerns for that we will deal with. But right now, we are all focused on getting this site cleaned up so that it's safe for everybody to do everything. Um, let me ask, are there other questions from board members? If you have one, one closing uh, Bill, item. Uh, yes, and as uh, Supervisor Collins aide can test that that site is part of the county plan for developing for affordable and low income housing as a site. Right. And the reading on the uh, next to the well, next to the customer room with soil vapor was, I believe, 2200 in April. Okay. I'm I appreciate you folks giving us the information on what kind of zoning and what kind of housing might go there, but we're concerned about all, all people, all economic strata. Right. <laughs> we, yes. we want the thing to be safe for everybody uh, once, once we finish. Exactly. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, ordinarily we have um, an opportunity for the board to ask the staff, any follow-up questions? I think we've been doing that, so all along. But are there other questions? Um, even though we can't specify the means of compliance, are, are, are there faster remediation methods that you're aware of than the ones currently proposed that are presumably more expensive? I mean, is, is there a trade-off between time and money in the remediation here, or is it simply the available technology? This is uh, what's proposed is is uh, very much uh, a pretty standard one that works a lot of places now. Um, so to speed it up, we'd be uh, doing more, just uh, more lines, more injections, more places. But, but, I mean, there there are other methods, but. This is a real common one uh, that's very effective, typically. Let me perhaps try to ask the same question in another way. Um, in many of these very complicated cleanups, if you're moving pieces around like a Rubik's Cube, and moving one piece affects the timing and the efficacy of another piece. Um, so I want to ask this question in, in the right way, but what I would personally like to see is for us to make sure that everything that can be done quickly is done quickly and doesn't get in line behind something else. So that we we try to do as much cleanup, pushing it as at the front end or the consultant tries to do that within the 10 year time frame as possible. Um, and I guess I need to ask you, is there any, uh, it, is there anything that the board would change in this order in order to get that done? Or is that something that you would then take as a direction to staff that would help you to make it happen under the uh, umbrella of, of this order if we were to adopt it. And that's kind of a backwards question. I really want this to happen as fast as it can, wherever it can. And okay. I want to make sure that that you folks are able to, to push that to the best of your ability, even if we go ahead and, and don't change anything in the order uh, if we adopt it today. I, I don't know if it would change anything in the order. Right? It looks like Laurent has something like Well, I, I think, you know, I mean, uh, following the comments that we received, I, I'm not sure we can, you know, 
make amendments, additional amendments in the order to accelerate the cleanup. Um, I think we already have tasks, actually, that one was mentioned by Bruce, related to the fact that if there is new information that is submitted to us, uh, that um, that would indicate that um, an accelerated cleanup can be uh, can be implemented at the site. Then we can, you know, use that task, for example, to to require uh, them to 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 refine in the middle of action. So, in also also in also in order to address Ms. Uh, Mr. Lefkowitz's uh, question related to uh, are there any other technologies that are um, that could be implementable at the site that would accelerate the cleanup. They are. I mean, they are, for example, I mean, you could devise something at a permeable reactive barrier uh, where you would uh, basically uh, have a barrier that has a treatment uh, system in it and that would be amended on, on a regular basis with a warm water extraction system. So basically, then you would pull water through that treatment system in order to accelerate uh, the cleanup. So that would be implementable, that would be expensive, uh, especially uh, considering the very uh, long bloom. Um, and, uh, you know, as Ralph was saying, I think the optimal method uh, of right now is really implementing basically this sort of passive transect that have amendments uh, and where one water passively goes through and, and gets treated. Um, so that's kind of, I guess, my answer to both questions. Right. So can I just ask the simpleton's follow-up question? So if more uh, passive reactive barriers well, we still have to clean up, you know, that volume of water. So, I mean, sure, if you would increase the resolution of the transect that you have, uh, you would you would decrease the time in which you know you would you would clean up. But at one point, you're gonna you know you're gonna still have you could still gonna deal with the lithology of the of the subsurface in, the, in terms of the fact that as to what was presenting, we are. We're dealing with, uh, with you know, um, a kilometer foot uh, of about 50, you know, foot, you know, per year. So I mean, you still have, you are still dealing with this, um, with this uh, constraints that, uh, short of putting a technology that actually accelerates, you know, the extraction of that water and treats it, uh, you are then, you know, against the, the natural environment and the, and the, uh, and you know, the constraint that the natural environment places upon your technology. So yes, I mean, if you put in a higher you know, density of, of transect, yes, you would treat a higher volume of water. Um, but I, yeah, at one point, there's going to be limited return on your investment. What, let, let me follow up on that and see if I, I got it right. I mean, it's one of the questions that I asked about flow rate. Uh, I mean, there are technologies called pump and treat. Mm -hmm. You know, it's where you pump it out and you use it and you protect it perhaps activated uh, carbon to strip out your, your contaminants. Um, and, and, and that kind of initially seemed attractive to me because you've got a big hole there under the building and maybe you can pull water. But it seems to me that with a, a flow rate of only 50 feet per year, you know, the transmissivity of your soil is just so low that there's a limitation to how, how much water you can pump out how fast, and the advantage of a treatment medium which has, you know, uh, bioremediation agents is they eat not just what's in the water but what's in the soil that might not get pulled when, if you pull the water. So it's got a, the benefit of a, a little more thorough um, uh, reactive, bioreactive uh, alteration of the, of the coxin. Or less Am I reasonably correct on that reasoning? Yes, you are, Ms. Mara. So you just can't I mean, pull with the with the lithology, and it's it's why I was poking around this because obviously I'd like to see it cleaned up faster, but there there's limitations to how how fast you can pull pull the water out of the soil, and even then you're going to leave some contaminants in the soil. I think you're better off with agents in the soil that are going to bioremediate the material and be more thorough. Now, whether or not that goes to everything that needs to be bioremediated, I think we're not completely satisfied. But I don't see pump and treat as a huge benefit. And I, I don't. I, I don't disagree. I don't disagree with that. I, I think the one part that gives
gives me pause. I'm, again, I'm not an engineer, and I don't want to second guess other competent engineers that are on the staff on this court. But I, but it, it does give me pause that the one other possible additional remedy that's available is further soil excavation. And I remember last time we talked about this, the notion was we did the excavation, we took confirming samples all around the pit. I remember the engineer from Geological Area, it all came back below action levels. We, we got it all. And it does give me pause. There's still concentrations of big soil vapor that are above commercial limits. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the recognition there, obviously, are still more hot spots. And and so you know I, I'm all for you know to the extent the horses are already out of the barn, all we have to do is these uh, these treatment walls that you know that's the best way to treat. I have no reason for second guessing that. I take it as a given, but I'd be happy to hear it from from uh, member uh, staff members that it's just not possible to identify where these additional hotspots are, or it's not of sufficient concentrations or amounts that it's worth actually going out. Because that's the one piece of this that I still don't quite have my arms around. And, 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 and it's particularly because of the discontinuity from what I heard last time we had this on our agenda and had evidence presented. Actually, that's, that's the reason we've added the task uh, 7B that requires submittal by the end of the year an addendum to the RAP to address the on-site soil vapor issues. And that could very well include uh, a variety of, of active measures, including uh, identification of some residual soil that can be removed or uh, other soil vapor remediation and mitigation. So I, I think we recognize that this is an issue that still needs to be addressed in the talk. Thank you. I don't think the board has any further questions of staff. Bruce, would you like to make a recommendation at this point? Quick, quick response to a comment that one of the commenters had early on. The council for Marina Plaza, and um, there was the the concern expressed about the opportunity to provide written comments in response to the changes to the tentative order. And just clarifying for the record that the changes to the tentative order were a logical outgrowth of comments received, and that our standard practice at this board is then to invite all parties to come and comment upon those. But there is no additional. Written, or written comment opportunity for anyone, so. Thank you. Yes. Well, uh, while this one didn't go quite as long as, as you know, it's, it's clear this is uh, an item that uh, is a concern both the board, the community, and the staff. I think we're taking, for what we're attempting to do with this amendment, taking a very conservative approach to ensure that we have ongoing public health protection and are aggressively working to uh, restore the water quality at this site and especially on the, the Savannah and Catholic uh, Charities properties. Uh, now I, I think uh, we internalize all the comments that, that the board and community are making both on the tenant order but also on the pending uh, long-term groundwater uh, remediation plan, which is, as you say, is not specifically uh, called out in the order passed identifying the, the dates that we expect to achieve, and now we're down to nine years, expect to achieve uh, the uh, maximum contaminant level. So uh, I think the discussion's been worthwhile, certainly, so I've taken it to, to be moving forward. I have heard anything that really, uh, in my mind, calls out a need to further amend the tentative order. Uh, so based on that, I'll recommend adoption of the tentative order report. So moved. Second. Uh, is there um, additional discussion? 
Um, first of all, I want to I want to express my appreciation to the, the local citizens. Uh, it, government works best when we're watched, uh, and, uh, and and I appreciate it. Uh, you guys kind of did a save on on this site, which wasn't getting the level of attention, um, and you've been responsible for the excavation of soil, uh, and I will give you full credit for that. Um, I don't agree with you on everything, um, but I listen to you fairly carefully. For me, the priority here is to get to the more contaminated groundwater areas. We are we got the tap off. Now we're looking at the, the highest levels. Um, we have heard the concerns about the edge of the plume, and, and this is not to be seen as an approval of the current approach as being sufficient. Rather, there is a mechanism, and I appreciate Marty for pointing it out to make sure that the, the, the target is to get everything under the, uh, the groundwater standards, the drinking water standards. Uh, but again, uh, even if you're disappointed somewhat at this result, I want to make sure that you, you appreciate it and listen to it. I just have one more thing. You know, uh, one thing that just struck me was the um, the number of requests for public outreach. And I just wonder, to make sure that we, we haven't missed any opportunities to participate in any uh, Marine Wood area meetings and that we our staff is available to attend anything the supervisor's office sets up or anything that uh, Mr. McDaniels' group sets up. We, we are available to participate in that, right? Oh, very much. And I think uh, we've put together a number of fact sheets. We've done participated in a number of, of hearings and, and public meetings in that area and we work closely with the supervisor's office and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. More than actually very more than hundred yards of the site. I think so. All right, I uh, I picked up on the same thing. I did want to make sure that we uh, at the staff level that you were going to follow up on um, Ms. Sackett's um, statement that, that they would welcome, that Supervisor Connelly would welcome you know, continued community meetings, and I'm pretty sure that was already on the staff's task list, but we'll make sure that it is on there, and if you could continue, please, to notify the board members as to when those are happening. Um, in case Mr. Kissinger or any of the rest of us want to attend one of the future ones that I would appreciate that. If there are no further comments, we will have a roll call vote. All right, let's go ahead. Thank you.